Okay, well, I'm delighted to be here to carry on the Scottish tradition of big men with beards. <laughs> of big men with beards working on the South African Alpha brand. So, unfortunately, I've, I've not long arrived, so you'll have to forgive me if I'm a bit incoherent at the moment. I think the number of names that you see here underlines the importance of worldwide collaboration, particularly on the Great White Shark. And in contrast to what some people have been saying, we find that funding flees for the shadows as soon as you mention white sharks in the United Kingdom. So what we're trying to do is begin to take very much an integrative approach to all the elasma brands we work on. We haven't been able to do this too much with the white shark at the moment because it's not recognised as a UK species, despite what some people tell you about seeing white sharks off the Scottish coast. <laughs> But we are heading in that direction. going to be carry on carriers, the great white shark we're going to talk about. And briefly, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the global population structure, the connectivity of the populations and the amount of gene flow we might see between them. I should thank Simon for giving an excellent talk beforehand because it makes my job a lot easier talking about genetics. I'll say a little bit about the local population studies we've done, in particular in South Africa and the Mediterranean, you're very lucky here in South Africa in that you have what we think is one of the oldest white shark populations. And also there's an indication that you've got two stocks here, at least from the mitochondrial DNA analysis that we've done. We have what we call a common and a local stock. And I'll say a little bit about a bit more about that later. Also, you're in a very interesting area, and we think that some years ago, South Africa and the things that happened off South Africa played a part in populating the Mediterranean with great white sharks. I'll say a little bit about current population sizes and connectivity of white sharks. Um, also, I'll let you into some of our future plans that we've got. We're actually involved in a next generation sequencing uh, project at the moment to really try and get a lot more markers for white sharks. One of the big problems we have is that when we did this work using microsatellites and mitochondrial DNA, there weren't a whole lot of microsatellites. Of course, I'm now being made out to look like a liar because just about a month ago, there was about 10 more microsatellites were published for the great white shark. <laughs> but one of the big problems is that with microsatellites, we don't get the same appreciation of current population sizes and gene flow as we do with some of the uh, markers we can generate from next generation sequencing. So a little bit of background very briefly as you all know it already probably on the great white shark. It's reasonably long lived, it's late in maturity, low fecundity and um, one of the obvious things that we found um, which was actually um, bolstered by tag data is that there is predictable site fidelity and natal filopatry. We saw that quite clearly. That was one of our first findings some 10 years and more now ago with great whites that there was natal filopatry. These are basically salmon with big teeth. <laughs> they return to the area in order to drop in pups. If you believe I'm a big man with a beard from Scotland, you'll believe that. <laughs> there are certain global top predators, obviously. Low effective population size. That makes it difficult for geneticists. We don't have a great deal of variation to work with. They're highly at risk, as I think we all appreciate. And there's various attempts been made to try and protect them. 
So for the population structure, our aims are really to assess the population structure in whites using mitochondrial and nuclear markers, determine if the subpopulation have low level of genetic diversity, and I should point out that I can use the space bar on my computer. It wasn't all run into one. It looked fine, it's obviously a Mac PC thing. Um, we also want to determine molecular data to support the designation of separate management units, or what we might determine as evolutionary significant units, and you can debate about that till the cows come home, or indeed till the sharks return to their naval sites. <laughs> Our sampling sites, as you can see, are reasonably worldwide. This is impressive for white shark population genetics. It's very unimpressive for just about any other species, including dogfish that you can think of, because we have reasonably small population samples from everywhere except South Africa. And I think that large population size underscores the great collaborations that we've had with people in South Africa to get us those, those uh, samples. We've also, into our, um, the analysis that I'll discuss here, included similar sequences from Barbara Block's lab, from Jorgensen, and um, some of our earlier sequences from Amanda Pardini's thesis. We did the first worldwide genetic analysis of white populations, and we used the mitochondrial DLU, what we think is the most variable part of the mitochondria. <coughs> and immediately, a few things pop out. You can see that the Northwest Atlantic looks reasonably different. It's separated here by about uh, seven mutational set. What these are, I know this looks like a map of the London Underground. <laughs> this, just like the stations on the London Underground, proximity tells you that those haplotypes, those mitochondrial types, are close together. And you can see some of them are separated by break lines there, which tell you that you've got big differences. You can see here that the Northeast Pacific, one of the most isolated pieces of ocean in the world, is really quite different to the Northwest Atlantic, which is a relief, uh, separated by some 43 mutational steps. Rather interestingly, you'll see, whoops, I really do have issues with this. You'll see that down here, we have some populations from Australia, and there should be a big arrow comes in here and says AUS, but it doesn't, which <laughs> seem to be not that dissimilar to the Mediterranean, and we'll come back to that in a moment. When we look at the haplotype distribution around South Africa, we can see we've got a common, common haplotype, which is represented by these red parts of the pi diagram, and we've got a less common haplotype, which is represented by yellow. Now, clearly, some of the work that we're going to do in conjunction with Stonebosch University, with Sarah Andriotti and Conrad Matisse, is going to improve the resolution of samples we have in this area. But you can see that the rarer haplotype seems to be more on the west coast. And that's quite, quite interesting. When you take a look at our one Brazilian sample, which we have here, it's this one, H54, then you can see that it's very similar to the um, samples of the rare haplotype that we have on the South African coast, as opposed to the commoner South African haplotypes. So could it be that we've actually got some movement between these parts of the Atlantic Ocean? So are we actually picking up animals that have moved over to South Africa at some point? Are they actually in the process of moving back and forth? This is one of the problems we have. We need to really try to get a handle on the population structure of great white sharks in order to help protect them. And from the genetic perspective, we are really looking at them with not as much resolution as we would like. We don't have enough samples. We don't have enough genetic markers. Some very clear things are obvious, like we have massive um, mitochondrial differences between Australia and South Africa in the order of the, in the D-loop about 4% of the sequence. And that tells us that there are probably bigger differences genetically 
for the mitochondrial DNA between some populations of great whites, as we're actually seeing between uh, some species of other fishes. But when it comes to trying to determine the population structure, we are really not getting a particularly clear picture all, all the time. It is clear that we have this name of filopatry. It is clear there are differences. But we'd really like to know how much current gene flow there is between those populations. So we turn to um, biparentally inherited markers, and that's the microsatellites. And here you can see that the Northwest Atlantic, this is very similar to the analysis that Simo put up before. This is looking at the uh, FST values, the amount of differentiation between populations. You can see the Northwest Atlantic is really quite different <coughs> to the Pacific populations and also to the New Zealand, Australia, and South African populations. So what we have here is that although the mitochondrial DNA between South African and New Zealand animals is substantially different. The biparentally inherited markers suggest they are really very similar. So there seems to be some gene flow between them with the females after they've mated perhaps returned to the medical sites. When we do our own kind of Bayesian analysis, you can see that we don't have those really nice, clear populations. And you can see that that difference between the Pacific and the rest of the world is, is really quite distinct. You can pick up some differences between the other populations. You can see where there's breaks, but there's not a whole lot of uh, differentiation. That's probably a reflection of the fact, one, that our sample size is not the greatest, except around South Africa, and two, that we're only using about eight microsatellites routinely, so we're not even using 12 like uh, Samoa was. So, population structure for the microsatellites does suggest there's clear gene flow between Australia and South Africa. It suggests there's gene flow throughout the Pacific. Possibly there's some gene flow across the Atlantic, but we really need more samples and better genetic resolution to get a good, a good handle on that. Now, my PhD student, Chris Ubley, who actually um, gave me this little uh, movie which I promised I would show <laughs> just, just suggests that obviously ocean currents may be playing a big part in the distribution of great whites. There seems to be some association with those different different currents. Certainly that's played a role we think in the past movement of great whites. One of the big questions we always have about these animals is how many individuals in any one area are there. And we've used, again, I didn't have that on my origin, we've used uh, various statistical attempts to try and determine the age when these populations split. We think the South African populations are probably in the order of about five million years old according to our estimates. We think they split around about two to three million years ago into a rare and a commoner type Probably they were in they were in different refugia. Whether one was in South America, the other was in Africa, we don't know. Um, the Northwest Atlantic, we think, separated off a little bit before then. Whereas the uh, Northeast and Northwest Pacific populations have differentiated much more recently. Now, when we try to get a handle on the size, the effective size, the uh, effective population size for the females of these these animals. I never did that. Uh, <laughs> okay, you can see that we end up with reasonable figures. We think there's uh, the commoner type, just over 3,000. The rare type, we would suggest, are probably not that rare. There's probably about 3,000 or so of those. When we combine those to get a much better estimate of the population size, because one thing I haven't shown you is the massive error bars that we tend to have on these kind of estimates. We think there's probably around about maybe 2,000 breeding females in South Africa. So that's not a huge amount of uh, sharks, but it's reasonable. But one thing we have to realize is that these are historical estimates because they're based on 
are microsatellites. So you go out today, you can maybe find there are only 200 breeding females. So, so far, on the basis of our world analysis, there might be four management units or ecologically significant units based on whether or not you go look at the mitochondrial DNA or the microsatellites. The two don't make up exactly. We think there are at least two possible stocks in South African waters, maybe two possible evolutionary significant units. Maybe, because we know that the, um, they, they have natal filipatry, maybe they're using different natal areas, maybe they have different home areas. But I said earlier on that South Africa has played a very important part geographically in the colonization of the Mediterranean. Now, great white shark sightings in the Mediterranean this is something the, holiday, the package holiday operators keep very quiet, <laughs> were actually quite common, as you can see. This is in the last 150 years in the Mediterranean. When we started looking at white sharks in the Mediterranean, we really didn't find a whole lot of them. But rather spookily, we found that there was not a lot of genetic differentiation. In fact, when Prissa first started to do this work, she came to me, and with the two samples we had, she said, they're both identical, and they both seem to be Pacific haplotypes. And of course, as a supervisor, my first reaction was, well, that's because you contaminated the sample. <laughs> extract it and do it again. So she came back and said, I've got the same result. And of course, I said the same thing. So we then went to another lab, not because we fell out, but in order to get away from any extraneous great white shark DNA in our laboratory, extracted them again, and got exactly the same result. And then fortuitously, two weeks later, <coughs> while we were mulling this over and what it meant, a group in Turkey actually sent us their sequences and said, this is really odd. We've got two great white sharks that have the haplotypes you identified as Pacific. And so I was immediately on the phone talking to these people. And we, we got some samples of their animals. We extracted the DNA, and they really are Pacific haplotypes. Since then, we've started to look all over the Mediterranean, and we find that we just get this single haplotype. And we think this is a consequence of a rare dispersal event. Somehow, a Pacific haplotype has gone in to the Mediterranean, we think, possibly, through uh, moving through the Atlantic. Now, there are clear western and eastern basin uh, in the Mediterranean. All our samples came from the eastern basin, which is physiochemically, and, and uh, from a bathymetric point of view, most like the Pacific uh, basins. And we've become particularly interested in the Mediterranean because we think it's probably a microcosm of what is going to happen with great sharks worldwide. It's a a highly polluted, um, highly commercialized, enclosed sea. And we think what we see happen today or tomorrow in the Mediterranean may well happen the day after tomorrow in the rest of the world from white sharks. <laughs> right. So by taking a look at the local population structure and migration patterns in the nursery areas, we're hoping that by actually looking at this in the Mediterranean, we might begin to understand a little bit more about how white sharks are used in the oceans and the sort of conservation strategies we can actually use. We started to collect other samples of great white shark. As you can see, we're now starting to populate the map a little bit better in the western basin. We've actually gone, because great white sharks are rarer than hen's teeth, contemporary samples are rather than hen's teeth in the Mediterranean. We've actually gone to various museums and we've taken samples of jaws and teeth and skin in some cases. Always helps to have a small child with you as well <laughs> because the curators all, all go, ah, Bella, and <laughs> give us access to all, all the material. <laughs> because we're working largely with degraded material, we can amplify only short fragments of. So we've got a whole series of primers which we've painstakingly developed. And Corey Robinson, who's one of my current PhD students, 
is actually is actually very proud because after a lot of sweat, blood, tears, and crying, she managed to produce this primer, which better amplified this particular area. But now we're able to reconstitute the full mitochondrial D-loop sequence, the most variable part. And the story is pretty much the same. We still seem to have this one haplotype in the Mediterranean. There's been dramatic declines of large predatory sharks in the Mediterranean recently. We need to determine the utilization and connectivity of vulnerable populations, because obviously populations don't have much connectivity with their, what we might call a sink population, then they can very quickly become extinct. Ours was the first genetic study of MEDS using the mitochondrial control sequences. And this is the result we got. We had some juvenile Mediterranean great whites. The sequences were all identical, although collected at different locations and different times. You can see that's the Mediterranean sequence. You can see it differs from the Indo-Pacific, Northeast Pacific, Californian populations by about roughly three, three um, mutational steps. But the strong separation, 43 mutational steps, from the Atlantic population, the populations that are closest to it are probably, the populations that are geographically closest are most different. So a very, very clear indication, particularly when you consider the maple fill pasture of these animals, that they didn't come from the Atlantic. Obviously, that tells us something about the history of the sharks that populated the Mediterranean, but it doesn't tell us whether or not there's actually gene flow in from the Atlantic. So just recently, we started to look at the microsatellites, and we're actually starting to get these to work in historical material now, again, after a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And what does start to come out of this is that those samples of animals we have do seem to be quite different to our North and West Atlantic populations. So it's suggested there's no biparentally, there's no gene flow of biparentally inherited markers. We're also trying to develop some new loci for that. So the big question is, how did these animals get into the Mediterranean from the Pacific? Well, simple dispersal from the closest population doesn't seem Viable, a viable hypothesis. What about <coughs> the most obvious route, which is the so-called sepian migrations, like a lot of uh, Indo-Pacific fish have colonized the Mediterranean from, from the Suez Canal. Well, that's the shortest route, but Suez, the Red Sea isn't a particularly good habitat for great whites. It's too warm. They'd have to get through the hypersaline bitter lakes. So that doesn't seem a possibility either. What about a rare, long-distance migratory event? We know white sharks are migrating between South Africa and Australia. What if they took a wrong turn off South Africa? What if they didn't turn back and go back to Australia, but carried on round the west coast of Africa? And that seems to be a particularly <coughs> stupid thing for a great white shark to do. And it would seem unimaginable. But when we started to set this in the, con in the context of time, when we started to think about the historical um, events which might have happened around about the time we think the Mediterranean was populated by great whites, it suddenly started to make sense. Something we have to bear in mind is that during glacial periods, the sea level would have dropped, and at that time, the Sundas of all shelf would have been an impassable barrier to not just great whites, but a lot of other of the uh, Pacific fauna. They wouldn't have gone into the Indian Ocean easily. And that's something which has caused substantial genetic differences between Indian Ocean and Pacific population of animals. <coughs> so we think that one possibility is there was a navigational error, prob possibly, by these animals not being swept along, but following uh, an agulus ring or eddy. Here you see an agulus ring. Those of you who are close enough will see this has been called Astrid, 
for some reason, which seems a good name for him, Gula Zedi. Um, during the last 700,000 years, they would have been remarkably stronger than they are now. During times of interglacial periods, there would have been very strong flow in the Agulas current. Um, we see occasionally we get these Agulas eddies coming off into the uh, Atlantic now, but during interglacial times, they would have been much more frequent and much stronger. If great whites are actually using the ocean currents as signposts, if they're navigating, as some of our uh, world population analysis seems to suggest, if they're navigating using them, then you can see that would be really unfair to the great white that got caught up in it. It would swim west, thinking, OK, I'm still in the Gulas world, still in the Gulas current. <laughs> that eddy would collapse, and to their astonishment, like when I woke up this morning, they would suddenly find they were somewhere where they didn't think they were. <laughs> I can blame it on a jet travel. Great white can't blame it on anything except when Google is heavy. We know that great whites exhibit strong natal filipatry, and they do follow these obscure uh, navigational cues to the same coastal area. So we think Fangra effect could explain that anomalous relationship that we've got for the Mediterranean population. We think there's been a historical long distance dispersal, likely a consequence of a navigational error, perhaps during past climatic oscillations, <coughs> such as an interglacial. But when? Here you can see this is current sea level. Here you can see sea level rises and falls. When we dated using our molecular clock the great whites in the Mediterranean, we estimated they probably got into there about 450,000 years ago, which was just about the time of an interglacial period when there would have been strong Agulis eddies. They would have been reduced to the eastern basin as an area of refuge during later glaciations, but we know that animals not just great whites, but also swordfish and tuna, have survived in that eastern basin refugium quite happily. What does this tell us about the future of the med great white? Well, there are few great whites in the North Atlantic, so migration into the med is probably very limited, and our microsatellite data is beginning to suggest that really is the case now. So we thought at one time, what if females swam out of the Mediterranean mated in the med and then swam back, or if we had males swimming into the med, mating with the females there. That doesn't seem to happen. It seems that the Mediterranean great white females live, give birth, and die in the med, and there's no gene flow in or out of the Mediterranean that we can detect. So we've got large resident females producing young, not immigrant females. And the fact that we are finding young in the Mediterranean is a good sign. But it does tell us that their future, the future of that population, perhaps more than any other population on the planet, is linked irrevocably with the fate of that anomalous haplotype in the Mediterranean. Now, the Mediterranean is well known as being an area which is overfished. There's a lot of pollution in there. We have interest in trying to assess uh, how much pollution and the effects that might be having on the sharks. But so far, all our guesstimates suggest that the future of the Mediterranean Great White is probably pretty grim. We've been kind of staggering along like a, a very old car firing on half the cylinders in its engine with these molecular genetic markers that we've got. We've got microsatellites, We've got mitochondrial DNA, and they've been fantastic for giving us an idea of how much population genetic resolution there might be amongst great white shark populations. But now we really need to come into the 21st century, and um, we're starting to do some next generation sequence analysis of the genome of the great white. The traditional markers we feel have very much reached their limit. We now need to go for what we call single nucleotide polymorphisms. And these are rapidly evolving, more so than the microsatellites, they evolve more rapidly, they're highly variable. They are focused on single base permutations, 
in a particular area of the genome of the great ones. Each SNP is found in a particular area. Also, as SNP stands for Scottish Nationalist Party, this is highly appropriate that we develop this technique in Aberdeen. <coughs> So far, Alex Salmond offered me no funding for this. <laughs> <laughs> but in an animal which is evolving very slowly, we know sharks evolve very slowly, this is the kind of approach we really need. It also gives us a much better chance for examining historical material because SNPs work much better than microsatellites on degraded tissue. So we're now starting next generation sequencing using a technique which would probably be of interest to no more than three people in the room, but it's called <laughs> restriction site-associated DNA tags. But basically, it gives us genome-wide screening for more markers. Now, our genome is about three gigabases. Unfortunately, the great white genome is twi over twice that size. It's about six and a half gigabases. So there's an awful lot of genome to sequence. And I asked our colleagues at GenePool we were working with, I said, how long will it take you to do that? They said, quite some time, probably an afternoon. <laughs> so you know, it, it kind of gives you an idea of how much things have started to progress. So far, we've got as far as trying to identify some of these possible mutations that may be useful to what we call SNP calling. And we've got and it bubbles the mind. We've got 184,000 possibilities, uh, and these are 100 base per um, bytes of, of the shark sequence. But they've got SNPs in there. Um, we can join those together. We do a thing called herd end reading, which gives us what we call context. In other words, think of it as sticking bits of DNA together to make pieces of DNA between four and 600 base pairs in size. When we do that, we've got about 100,000 possible markers to use. And of course, we need to filter out these using quality control. Then we're going to have to what we call biologically filter, which is, in other words, is identify those which are actually um, going to be useful for looking at our different populations. We're also going to blast them, which doesn't mean we, we stand and curse at them. Well, that's what population genesis do in front of a computer a lot of the time. But what it means is that we're going to take those sequences and we're going to look on the databases to see if they uh, correspond with a particular gene. So we may actually be able to find markers from this which are selectable, maybe markers for fecundity or <coughs> for temperature resistance. These, these kind of things are a possibility. Um, when we look at them, we've got about 50,000 in the New Zealand population we're looking at, about 45,000 in the South African population. That suggests we've probably got about 25,000 which are going to be useful markers for differentiating between South Africa and New Zealand. And although these are really good high resolution markers, they probably don't give us as much population differentiation as pound for pound, as, or I should say marker for marker, as microsatellites do. You usually would say you need 10 SNPs to give you the same population resolution as a single microsatellite marker. So if we've got 25,000 of them, then we've got quite a lot to choose from. But what they do do is give us much better analysis of current gene flow and current population sizes that we can get from the microsatellites. So, <clears throat> as Herman was suggesting, what we're going to do is feed all this into a more integrated approach. We're going to use this to look to see how genetically discrete our populations are. We're going to be able to use it successfully on historical material. So that's going to give us a whole new approach to looking at populations of great whites worldwide. We'll be able to offer localized and global population connectivity, contemporary. Um, we'll also be able to feed that into work we do on ecosystem utility and fine, fine scale structure. And hopefully that will lead to better conservation management strategies 
um, allow you guys to really get a better handle on how you can conserve this species worldwide. And hopefully, because we've used so many sharks in South Africa, South Africa will be able to really lead the way in this kind of approach. Okay, so I'd like to acknowledge a worldwide group of people who have helped us with this, but also some of our sponsors and main collaborators. Again, sorry about the issues with the with the presentation. Thank you.